You can find that at talesfromthecloakroom.com. Uh, you can find me at Chris Does Comics on Twitter and can follow the project at Cloakroom Comics. And you're watching Two Geeks Talking. Hi, I'm Aubrey Lynn Jepson, and I am an editor and story consultant on Scott Snyder's Presents Tales from the Cloakroom. You can find us on Twitter at cloakroomcomics.com. You can find me on Twitter at Taming the Muse. And you're watching Two Geeks Talking. Hi, this is Ben McRae. I am a contributing writer and artist on uh, the Tales from the Cloakroom anthology uh, presented by Scott Snyder. You can find us at talesfromthecloakroom.com. And you are watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by not one, not two, but three very talented and amazing people in their own rights. They are together for an anthology. It's Scott Snyder Presents Tales from the Cloakroom. And because there are three people, it's going to be a rowdy interview, I'm sure, because everyone has their own amazing talents with this amazing book. That being said, we are joined today by C.K. Lawson, Aubrey Jepson, and Ben McRae. How are you all doing today? Grant, thanks very much. Doing great. Well. For those that don't know anything about this particular anthology, tell us who are you and what are you bringing to, of course, to Geeks Talking? Uh, C.K. Lawson uh, started off as a writer in the anthology and I also then took on some editorial responsibilities. So I've, I've been at that since uh, October, um, pretty much at every stage in the process from script review to budgeting to uh, the Kickstarter build. I'm Aubrey Lynn Jepson. I did very similar duties to CK. I initially came on as a story consultant and I had just planned to edit, but as we got deeper into the project, I was like, I'm going to apply all the other skills I know. <laughs> and so I'm working on everything they mentioned. And then also like some of the production duties, I'm going to help with com compiling the book for print and things like that. My name's Ben McRae. I am a contributor to the anthology. I do comparatively far less than either of these two individuals that I'm with. I write and I illustrate and I do behind the scenes moral support. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. How did this anthology get put together and how many creators are involved in it? A lot of creators. Initially, Joe G. Schuster, one of the part of the editorial team, he just wanted to create a book and he wasn't sure he had like all the skills he needed to do that. And so he started recruiting other people. So Ben O'Grady, the other member of the editorial team came on and then they kind of threw it out to the Scott Schuster discord that built on itself. And then we had people submitting scripts. Ben reached out to me via DM and was like, hey, do you want to come submit a script? I was like, no, I'd rather come edit. We have 20 stories and some of them are writers with like a full team, like a colorist and a letterer and a artist. And then some of them are like, like Ben, who did it all. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly how many we have. CK might, but like there's 20 stories and I bet we're upwards of 50 creators involved. The other uh, co-editor, Ben O'Grady, I think he recently said it was about 60 creators overall. The Discord is, you know, coming out of Scott Snyder's Discord, a big uh, Discord for his whole writing class. And we did kind of a, a Discord branch off of that. That one mainly focuses on a, a community for the writers. And then every writer was responsible for creating their own creative team. So yeah, I think in the end, it's around 60 creators, if Ben is uh, correct on, those, uh, on that account. So then why, are, why is this type of anthology important to tell? I think it's extremely important because there's a ridiculous amount of talent out there that is not getting any exposure. We were so highly impressed with what people were submitting in the Discord, in Scott Snyder's Discord. And then when we started getting the scripts in for people who are interested in this, because what Joe did, and I think Ben did as well, is just post in that class Discord, it was like a thousand people, uh, just post in there, hey, who's interested in creating an anthology? And then out of that, I think about 40 people joined our Discord. And out of those 40, about 20 ended up submitting a story or 24. And we were super impressed. Uh, both Aubrey and I were talking about all the scripts behind the scenes and how impressed we were with the, with the writing. We just think there's a huge group out there of emerging and new voices that just really have a right to be heard. We also are big supporters of, of marginalized communities and giving them a voice. Over 50% of our creators 
are either 2SLGBTQIA+, like myself, disabled like myself, or differently abled, if you prefer that term, Black, Indigenous, people of color. And of course, we wanted to, to highlight women as well. And we were really excited that we at least crossed the, the halfway mark there. I think it's important for that reason. And this outlet was great to do that because Scott is so welcoming when it comes to uh, support. Uh, he's been there as a cheerleader for us from the beginning. Uh, he's going to do some stuff for us with the Kickstarter that maybe we'll talk about later in the in the interview. Mm -hmm. This was a perfect opportunity to take advantage of that and try to get these voices heard. Ben, what is your story title and what was your process for creating it? The title of my story is Spuds, uh, which uh, I've come to realize is not as commonly known a term as I originally thought it was. Uh, it means potatoes for those who don't know. The process... I tend to think of things fairly abstractly when it comes to uh, creating a story. I find something that I like uh, about any given scenario or given situation. Uh, I often liken it to like trying to find a single spinning golden thread in like a, a, a storm or a tempest and trying to latch on to what that is and find that to be the, the core of, of what I'm writing and follow that through to uh, its inevitable conclusion, whatever that might be. In this case, it started with potatoes. When I posted my uh, six pager in the class discord where a thousand people could look at it, which was scary. Bim, I need feedback. A dozen people read it and said, oh, this is great. Don't change a thing. And I was like, no, 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 it's not perfect. I need somebody to give me advice. And Bim was the only one that DM'd me and was like, uh, do you really want feedback here? And I was like, yes. <laughs> And what I love, I use Aubrey and Bim in editorial now and, you know, pay them to do editorial work for me when I pitch for submissions and stuff, because Bim, like Aubrey, has that visual eye and has experience with every part of the process, very similar to, to Aubrey and her graphic uh, design eye and now her lettering experience. I don't want Bim to sell himself too short there. It's, it's pretty spectacular what he's able to do. Uh, he can see your entire story in his head and it, it gives an insight that uh that is rare i appreciate that thank you dk it's good to have um not only solid people around you especially when it comes to an anthology but also you know people that aren't willing to to hold back when it comes to critiques and or uh, good advice i mean that's always the the process of being a creative person whether you're doing comics or film or or whatever it may be so that's wonderful mm -hmm. to have yeah, I think yeah, it's important to um, cultivate a sort of uh, an environment. And I think the, the people in the anthology, everyone involved uh, thus far has been very, uh, very good at this, is sort of cultivating uh, this atmosphere of feeling safe to share your work and to know that there are things that are going to get picked apart from it. But it is in the spirit of like building each other up and never the idea of like saying, oh, that's a terrible idea. Or, that's rubbish. Don't do that. It's always about trying to help someone find their own voice and find their own way of improving and moving forward with the story and making it the, the best thing that it can be. And Aubrey, of course, being an editor uh, and, and a graphical person that you are as well, too, uh, must have been difficult, especially with the anthology as large as it is. And I'm sure as, as talented as all of these amazing people are, what did you edit out of this book, at least in regards to your editing side of things, maybe could have been used for possibly another story? That's a hard question. There were a lot of things, and we've gotten this feedback from other people that we've like interviewed with, media we've talked to. There's a real focus on character. And so there were probably times where we had to cut details that weren't pertinent to the story. It's been long enough that I can't think of a specific detail. We were editing the scripts back in September, October of last year. I can't remember specifics. A lot of it was also, hey, you don't have room for this many words. Like, this is a cool sentiment you've thrown in here, but you have 70 words in this panel and you have six panels on this page. It's not going to fit with your art. So I think more of it was editing out because some of our creators are really new to comics. And so they didn't know things like, oh, I can't put this much dialogue on a page or I can't request that the artist draw this much stuff because they're just not used to the medium. It's just coaching them like, hey. If you're requesting that the artist draws, you know, a hundred different guys fighting in the background, that's going to take them days. So you can't operate like that. Mostly stuff like that. Like I felt like a lot of the stories were really solid, even when they hit our desks. And there were a few that we did have to let go because they just didn't quite make 
the cut yet, but we spent a lot of time still working with them and being like, here's how you hone that idea. I think that's what I wish we could have included was the stories that had to be cut because they're, they're great creators and they were really fun to work with. Maybe next time. Just means that it has to be uh, Tales from the Cloak Room too. Yeah. <laughs> Se- second look. <laughs> in your opinion, in any of your opinions, and this is for all three of you, what is the most important quality of a, a writer or an artist in the comics industry today? And how did that translate to what you created for the anthology? I think flexibility is super important and being able to collaborate is really important. I've been doing this like on and off for 10 years, like being trying to get into the comics industry. And I've noticed some people approach it like it's a business arrangement where they're the boss, like right, like, like from a writer's perspective and that everybody else is working for them. And I think that chips away at the amazing relationship you can have with the people you're working with. Like Ben said, we have this community that we've built that we can all support each other. We can all help each other. And that has been fostered through like collaboration and advice and stuff like that. And so I think approaching artists and people you're working with as experts that you're collaborating with is really important. If you value them, they'll value you, if that makes sense. So yeah, that's kind of where I land with it. The things that I would value most among other creators and that I think generally all creators should try to aspire for is a sense of just openness and honesty with not only yourself, but also with the people that you're working with. I mean, that's in terms of your business relationships and saying like, if you're not going to make a deadline, let someone know you're not going to make a deadline. If you think that the script you've been given to draw is not working for you in whatever way, get in touch with the writer and talk it through with them. If the art that you're getting back does not reflect what you feel is accurate to what you have written, if, if it doesn't have that cohesion, get in touch with the artist and talk it through with them. You have to be open and honest with that. As uh, a creator, if you are you know, writing or drawing, be open and honest with yourself. You know, uh, Allow yourself the time to do what you need to do. Be able to acknowledge if something in your story is not working, but also be able to acknowledge when you have done something great. It's a common thing with, uh, I think, most creators at a certain point to just sort of say, oh, this is all rubbish and everything I've done is terrible. And, you know, it doesn't matter how many people say, oh, no, it's great. This is this is wonderful. You've done a good job. You're you're kind of resistant to that. But you have to be open and and honest with that part of it as well and uh, allow yourself a victory when you get one, because, uh, you know, they can be few and far between. So make the most of them when they're around. Okay, so for me, the most important quality for a writer is kind of contrasting with what Bim said is a lot of writers think they don't need feedback and they are perfect. And don't you dare tell them to change a single word. They are great. And how dare you? I've self-published. Who are you to tell me what to do? Um, So I would think the biggest one is to be a little bit more humble than we've come across with some people, not our group in general, just a general feel we've gotten from talking with a a few writers is you definitely need to listen to your editor and you need to listen to someone. If you're going to say, would you please review my work? Don't mean, will you please like tell me how great I am? (laughs) I would say that's the biggest takeaway for a writer these days. As far as artists, I don't think I feel qualified enough to say like when I talk to an artist, I just immediately go, oh my God, you're amazing. Here's a pitch for me. Would you even consider taking this on? Do you have the time? Um, I would love to work with you. So for me, it's just more about how a writer approaches an artist more so than me being able to speak to to the best quality uh, that an artist would need. I just I just think writers should be more, uh, like Aubrey said, a little bit more uh, understanding of a, the collaborative nature of the medium. As creative people that you are, what is the hardest part about your creative process, the beginning, the middle, or the end? Mine varies. Sometimes my creative process is I can see the end very clearly. And I have no idea how to start it. Other times I just see little scenes and little phrases I want to throw in. And then how can I take all these notes I've made and build a story out of it? But I'd say, generally speaking, the beginning is extremely tough for me. I was having this conversation with a, a publisher recently that we're working on a graphic novella for next year that's too soon to announce. But I told them, I was just like, look, beginnings are hard. Do you have any ideas? about how to get to my theme. And they gave me some good advice. So for me, the beginning is very hard for me to nail down because you have to right out the gate, grab them while also establishing um, the theme that you want to explore. 
So for me, that that's the hardest. For me, I would I would say the opposite. It's the end for me that is always the trickiest part, both in terms of writing and in terms of the art. In terms of writing, sometimes the story goes somewhere I did not expect it to go, and sometimes it goes somewhere I didn't even want it to go. But if that's where the story goes, that's where it goes, and uh, I kind of have to go with that. You know, this is true for both writing and art. You have to know when something is done. Given my druthers, I would re-edit every single panel, every single page over and over ad nauseum because, you know, you want it to be perfect or as perfect as it can be. And at a certain point, you just have to sort of step back and say, this is this is done now. I can't touch this anymore. And that is a hard thing to do, to let it go and say, I'm not touching the story ever again. It's written, it's drawn, the colors are in, the letters are in, it has been sent off, it is now out of my hands kind of forever. And that can be a disconcerting feeling to relinquish all control of this thing that you had so much input and control over and to say it's it's done now. So endings are harder, harder for me. I just, I kind of never really want it to be over. I can round out the back end of this and say the middles are the hardest for me. Hey, we're a full um, horse. I, I mean, I think both of what each of them said does apply, but for me, that's when the imposter syndrome strikes is when I'm in the middle of a project where I'm like, do I have any business doing this? Why does anyone take me seriously? <laughs> Those kinds of things. But then you kind of have to like talk to your friends and get a pep talk. And CK has definitely offered me pep talks before when I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. And then you have to remind yourself, you do know what you do, you're doing and you've worked incredibly hard at knowing what you're doing. But yeah, the middles can be hard because I think too, like in story, middle can be hard because you got to make sure you're still amping up the tension and that it remains interesting. I just think the middle tends to be the meat of the story. And so that tends to be where you kind of get bogged down. For me, at least, that's where I tend to get bogged down with like, finishing the work that's always been a problem for me i gotta make sure i finish that's why i love being an editor because i get to evaluate finished work and to piggyback off of what everybody said what i find interesting and anybody in the indie creator community i'm sure understands this but for those listeners who are just really comics enthusiasts you finish the script and or at least for me and then you're like okay at least it's done and now i'm kind of over it and i don't want to deal with this anymore and then the art comes back and you get excited again and then you have to do the lettering pass to make sure the, the wording matches with the art and you didn't put too many and maybe you need to move this. That. And then after that, you're like, I'm so sick of this. I never want to see it again. <laughs> and then when you see the finished product, you get all excited again. So it's, <laughs> it's an interesting process that I don't think a lot of, I definitely didn't understand until I got into the weeds of everything with all of this. But uh, it's an interesting love-hate relationship with your own art. Yeah, that's true. CK does this all the time. It drives me absolutely mental because they'll, you know, they'll send me this brilliant script of, you know, full of these fantastic characters and like, you know, it needs like a little bit of polishing here and there. It's like minor stuff. They'll come back like a week later and be like, oh, I hate this. Everything I've done is I'm done with this whole project. It's so terrible. I'm like, this is brilliant stuff that you're putting out. I understand the fatigue it causes though. So like, I, I get it. I, I just want to be everybody's biggest cheerleader and say, you're doing great. You're doing a wonderful job. But it can be hard for sure. It can be it can be hard to just invest yourself so to in such totality to a, a single um, project. You know, ten pages of story. It's uh, it's a lot to put yourself into. But how do you think the birth of creativity was formed? I think creativity has been woven in from the very start of humanity. I mean, going all the way back to telling stories with writings in cave walls. The creative spirit has always been there, whether it uh, came out of a need for not yet having a language and needing to drive things through, uh, like I said, art on the walls. So I just think it's been there from the beginning. It's inherent. I think people don't get how important creativity is to the world at large. Look at what happened during the beginning of COVID. What did everybody turn to? They turned to, you know, television or movies, rewatching plays on YouTube or books or comic books. And that's all art. So I think the creative spirit's been there from the very start of humanity. I would tend to agree with that. I mean, part of my personal philosophy in life is that everyone is a creator. Even if you, you, you don't feel like you're particularly active in the arts or anything, like everything that you do as, you know, as a person is, is a choice that you make. You know, you are creating 
a persona day by day. You're becoming a different person and that's based on the choices you have made. In the grand scheme of things, you know, everybody's life is, you know, part of this big tapestry and whether or not you are actively engaging with trying to create or cultivate something from that, we create things for ourselves all the times. We create our own lives. We create our own mythos as people. I agree with CK that it is inherent, I think, in uh, in people to create. Part of it is escapism. I love to read books as a child and consume all kinds of media, like movies, comics, everything. It was to live the lives of those characters. I loved Catwoman in the animated Batman series, and that has continued across my life. Like, I have a statue of her here in my office. But to escape the mundane into something magical, mystical, or fantastical is, I think, one of the huge benefits of storytelling. And I think that's part of why we do it is because as, as creators, we get to escape, but then we get to share that escape with other people. And so to me, that's part of the birth of creativity is going beyond ourselves into something new and unexplored. To build off of what Bim said, but also uh, me knowing a lot about Aubrey's life because, you know, she and I are attached at the hip at this point. You know, even gamers, like you might not consider yourself a creative person, but you're creating an avatar in the game sometimes. You're creating a story for that character in the game. So even like people who have a regular day-to-day job, nine to five, and then go home and play video games, you're a creative, like you're creating something. Even without like an avatar, like a lot of people create an online persona for gaming. Like they have their World of Warcraft raid friends and they're like a different person with them and they have their work friends and they're a different person with them. And all of these different interpretations of an individual are equally valid. There's no like one true person. Like you are creating all of these different aspects of yourself. They're all a part Um, of you. yeah, Yeah, exactly. Um, That's funny that Ben mentioned that because like on Discord, I go by a different name. I go by my full name in like anything professional, but I have a different name if you DM me and that's because it's a gaming tag. Mm -hmm. And there's definitely a persona for that gaming tag that I inhabit when I'm playing on my Oculus. So yeah, we definitely shift in and out of these really interesting creative spaces. (laughs) It's funny you mentioned World of Warcraft. I did three and a half years on a West Coast server and I'm on the East Coast, so good time. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the sacrifices we make you know, yeah, 3 a.m's uh to 6 a.m starts at jobs were really tough i oh, feel man. that i feel that but i wouldn't trade it for any in the world i made some great friends during that that time so yeah exactly that's it's it's you know because you do find, find that bond with other people who are you know doing that same thing who are also have you know, that shared aspect of that persona uh, with you, it, it resonates. So it's it's absolutely worth it to do to do things like that. Now that we've segued into games, into comics, and everything like that, from a creativity standpoint, the Kickstarter is currently ongoing. Is that correct? Yes, it is ongoing. <laughs> you are yes. correct. Here, here in the future. Yes. <laughs> Shh, don't break the fourth wall. <laughs> um, it's a great feature. The- what are you expecting from this and what response are you expecting from it? Especially because campaigns themselves are, are basically a second job when it comes to everything. I mean, you're putting a lot of time and effort into not only promotion, but shows like this and everything along that line and getting a final product, et cetera. But, but from your perspectives, all three of you, uh, what are you looking to accomplishing? Oh my goodness. I tend to be the practical one. So I've always been like, okay, guys, this could just be our friends and family funding us on this one. Um, and everybody else is much more optimistic than I am, but I, that, that's just in my nature, but it is a lot. It is so much work. I didn't realize how much work it was until we started getting into it. And luckily we've been able to take it in bites as we needed to. I did a lot of graphics for the Kickstarter, populating that stuff and creating a video and stuff was a lot from a creative standpoint, because you just, you just want to sell the book. You just want to get the book out there and in people's hands, but you, you do have to market it. This is actually the fun part for me that we're getting to talk to you. We're getting to share the book. We're getting feedback and it's been so positive and so invigorating because we've, you know, we've had this thing in our pocket for nine months. And now that we're finally able to put a shit out into the world, we get to see what other people think of it. And we don't just go based off of our own interpretations. Yeah, I will say that uh, both Aubrey and CK have been working incredibly hard behind the scenes on the whole uh, Kickstarter thing. I am blissfully uh, removed from any 
any aspect of that except to occasionally, you know, pop into everybody's DMs and be like, you're doing a great job. Keep it up. I have uh, no experience running a Kickstarter campaign. And uh, these two, uh, along with the rest of the editorial team, have done a phenomenal job of just like doing things like this, lining up interviews and promoting and uh, huge thanks and congratulations to both of them for doing such a, a phenomenal work with it thus far. I would say for me, I had a couple of things I wanted uh, coming out of this with with expectations and things. One, I wanted to build up my repertoire of knowledge with the editorial side of things. That was really important to me, and I consider it already an excess, a success from that angle. Two, I wanted to do justice uh, by all the 20 writers involved. And of course, a lot of the artists, although a lot of the artists are, are some of them are, are quite known in the indie community, but the writers, you know, about half of them have maybe self-published or had little things here and there. The other half are brand new. Like I don't, I asked them this just the other day. I don't understand how he hasn't been published at this point. So it's just, I wanted to give all of these people a chance to reach an audience that they haven't had a chance to yet. I think the entire editorial team, that was a, a big thing for us. Joe G. Schuster and Ben O'Grady definitely are more of the dreamers of the editorial team. Aubrey's probably the most realistic and I'm somewhere in the middle. I'm worried because I think when people see Scott Snyder's name attached, that maybe in the indie world, they think they don't really need to help and support us because, oh, well, it's Scott's name attached. They're going to be just fine. I'm kind of with Aubrey. I don't think his name necessarily is going to carry the book. So when I hear other people in the group talking about selling hundreds of books and making thousands of dollars profit. I don't see that. For me, a success is a writer can walk into a local comic shop and it's right there on the shelves. If we can talk some shops into buying copies or just knowing it's out in the world, that, that's a success to me. Like Aubrey and I have said that before, when this book gets in our hands, I'm sure I'm going to ball my eyes out because it's just been such an intense labor of love. So already it's successful to me. As long as we hit that Kickstarter goal, it's a success to me. I'd say the thing I am most looking forward to with all of this is being able to just walk into my my local uh, comic book shop, you know, where I've been going for years, where I know the people that work there, and see something that I made that I contributed to on the shelf with all the other uh, books next to the names of all these people who you know I hold in a certain amount of regard for the work that they do. It's a small thing. It means the world. So then other than your own uh, stories in this particular anthology, are there any others that are your favorites? Like one one favorite in particular from each of them? Yeah, I love, um, so I don't have a story in the anthology. I'm strictly editorial. I'm the only one who doesn't. I really, I mean, there. it's really hard. This is like making me choose a favorite child. Mm -hmm. But I really love Alyssa Meyer's story, Malachi. It's really emotional and I love her art style. It's very different than a lot of comic styles are right now, but I think it's just unique enough and and her coloring is so gorgeous. She's another one who did a lot of the art on her own comic. I think she may have done it all. I can't remember off the top of my head. She did. Yeah, yeah I think she did all of it. And she's just incredibly talented. It's so heartfelt. Stories in this book will make you cry. I'm not lying. Um, they make me cry and I've read them several times. Not so. all of them. So yeah, not all of them. we've no, discussed this. There was my, a balance struck. My copy line is always they'll make you laugh, they'll make you cry, they'll make you afraid, they'll make you excited. Like we have a little bit of everything. That's one I'm I would I, that just came to mind immediately when you asked that question. But there's so many that are so good. <laughs> yeah, I agree absolutely. Like Alyssa's work is phenomenal. Uh she reminds me so much of um her her cartooning style reminds me a lot of Jeff Lemire's work. And I know she was feeling at a certain point a little unsure about it because it's not traditional um, comic book art in terms of very heavy heavy lines that it's gorgeous work i am also uh, a, a very big fan and personally invested in ck story because they came to me with early editorials on it just to, to get my general thoughts and stuff and so i feel very personally invested in that one because i've seen it come from initial story through all of the edits through all the the art coming in the edits to the art and putting it all together like i've i've so watching somebody else's story come together from beginning to end has been a really wonderful experience um because i get to see it with my own work seeing someone else's thing and and watching it sort of come to life has been phenomenal and it's a beautiful beautiful story like 
uh, CK just uh, hits you in the fields every every time, and it's it's gorgeous. And I'm I'm really looking forward to seeing other people's reactions to it because I think it's a phenomenal piece of work. Oh, that means a lot. Uh, it definitely is. Tends to be like a they either love it or they're like, oh, why did you do that to me? <laughs> um, I strongly support uh, Malachi. It's phenomenal. Alyssa Meyer doing all of her stuff, but to give just another one, I would say. I think Skeleton by uh, T, I'm about to butcher the last name. I'm not sure if it's Belloc or Belloc, but it is a, a really good story. Even though we have a lot of queer creators, we just happen to, and mine has a little bit of, of queerness in it, but based on the way the story's being told, it would make no sense for it to be a queer-centric story. Even though we have a lot of queer creators, they did not explore a lot of queer stories this time around. By no mandate or anything, it just so happened to be that way. Tease does a really great job of telling an experience of a trans character and how the, the dynamic with, is with that person's family. What really comes to mind is the, the closing image. I just can't get out of my head and it really sends chills. Like I just got goosebumps over it. Every time I think of it, it's a, it's such a strong work just from the, the message it's trying to get across. At what point are we good enough? I, my immediate answer was you're always good enough. And that's because I have worked with a therapist who we went into a lot about being feeling worthy. I think you're always good enough. You may not be at the level you want to be at, but you're always good enough for where you are. So just keep going. Artistically, I think I'm never good enough, but I thrive off of that energy. So I, cause it just makes me want to be more perfect in life. I've got to come to terms with the fact that I'm always good enough. Yes. And it took, I'm 40 something years old now and probably took me a good 30, 35 years to figure that out. I am going to be that annoying person and sort of do a Socrates to Plato and reframe it back to you and say like, good enough for what? Like, it's easy to compare yourself to other things and say, am I as good as this or am I as good as this? But are you good enough to do what you do? always as you know it's the same as uh, what what aubrey said you are always good enough it might not always be good enough to someone else's standards that's kind of uh, on them and that's kind of part of your journey as a person and as a creative as you try to better yourself but where you are right now is good enough for something so be good enough for that and then if you feel you're not good enough for something else, try to get better at it. Anyone can get good. Yeah, what was an early experience where you learned that language had power? Oh, um, I can jump on this one too. I think I've definitely been called a bitch several times by men who were not happy with my behavior. And I think they think that's really mean. But to me, I realized my power was in not like laughing at that, that they think that that's going to do anything to me. I loved Wonder Woman growing up. So I've always been the sort to stand up to bullies. I realized with that, like that word and other words like it, that I could just kind of laugh and take the power back. Like it doesn't have to do anything unless I let it do anything. I realized around puberty that, that uh, words have a lot of power because that's when I started getting called trigger warning here. It got called faggot a lot in school. Uh, that's when my extremely religious family, I started hearing things like, not for my family, but a, 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 another member of the church saying how they disowned a family member because they were gay. That's when I first realized how strong uh, a hold language has over us. It, yeah, it, it matters, you know, 30 years later, still have flashbacks to being called faggot on a daily basis. And um, I've learned to reclaim the word now. That's what comes to mind when you ask that question. For me, uh, it's uh, nothing uh, quite so uh, serious or heavy as that. It's just I remember being a kid and not really having a a way of fitting in. Like I was never uh, very athletic. I was, you know, never part of any sports teams. I, you know, I didn't really have a a place where I could. Uh, sort of assert who I was as as an individual. Uh, and we had this assignment when I was in school that we had to give some sort of speech about something. You have to stand up and do like a five-minute presentation on whatever. And I just got up and I just sort of rambled. Basically, <laughs> what a ridiculous uh, system 
that uh, we as a society, and in particular at that time, the school had created in establishing our own self-worth. And it really resonated with all of the other students. And a lot of people responded to that. They said that they understood it and that they felt the same way. And that was a connection with people who were my peers that I hadn't had before. And it was because I, I stood up and I spoke and I said what I felt and what I was thinking and did it in a way that I felt was uh, accessible to them. Um, and I think that was kind of my first understanding that, you know, your, your words can have that effect on people, can reach other people and help you find something in common with them. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Creatively, I mean, it's super cliche, but uh, Alan Moore. Uh, when I read his work with J.H. Williams III uh, on Promethea, it just really spoke to me on a philosophical level, made me reevaluate my life. And of course, it's just pure poetry. So for me, for sure, Alan Moore. When I said I started 10 years ago, I went to a workshop taught by Kelly Sudikonik. And I went there to just meet her because I was a fan of the comics. I had planned on being a novelist, not anything to do with comics. And I went to the first day thinking I'd go to the second day where the novelist, like the first day was just like craft talk. And then the second day was going to be the workshop. And I thought, oh, I'll go to the first day with Kelly Sue just to meet her and get excited. And then I just stayed and was like, okay, this is amazing. This is where I want to be. So that completely like altered the trajectory of my creative career and got me to where I am today. For me, I'm to uh, be even more cliche and say, uh, in all honesty, it was my parents from beginning to end, like from such a young age, they, they're they both starving artists who came together to have far more kids than they had any right <laughs> having with the little amount of money they had. But they instilled in me from such a young age, uh, a love of music and literature and art. And, you know, they were always taking me to galleries and making me listen to all their old records, a lot of which I have now in my house and I force my young son to listen to. They read to me every night. They always encouraged me to, uh, to pursue any artistic uh, endeavors, the usual sort of parental caveat of, well, make sure you have a backup plan in case you don't make enough money to, you know. They were always very supportive of me and always, yeah, from a very, very beginning of my life, always um, let me know that art was an option, that it was, uh, it was a worthy pursuit. And so I, I, I really have to uh, credit them for that one. From a professional standpoint, you have all helped to create an anthology and I'm sure it'll be successful in your Kickstarter campaign. And you've all created works yourselves as well, separately and maybe together in the future. So professionally, you are successful in that regard. Do you consider yourselves personally successful? It largely depends on the day. <laughs> this has felt really good. And I do feel like this is a success. And even if, even if the Kickstarter doesn't make its goal, but I, I, I really think it will. I still feel like we've learned so much and done so much that it's a successful effort. We can replicate what we've done here and, and apply it to future things. And that's always a, as long as you're learning, it's a success for me. I'm going to speak more broadly about life in general. The biggest thing coming out of Scott Standard's class for me is this family that we've created. Amazing, like Bama said, this like community that, that encourages you and things like that. And I have had people DM me from that group and be like, how do you not freak out with feeling like you're going to be a failure and not succeed? And I'm like, well, what are you considering successful? For me, I became disabled at 24 until I was 30. I barely get out of bed because they had not discovered the medicine for my condition yet. So I thought my entire life was over after putting in a tremendous amount of work from early on all the way through grad school and getting a, a graduate degree at 22, a master's degree at 22. And I was like, okay, here's the start of my life. And then it crashed and burned. For those six years, I thought I was never going to even function again. And then I finally now can slowly start to function somewhat. And now I'm getting to pursue a passion because for a while there, it was like, okay, you're disabled. You just be happy you found a job, Chris, and that's it. Like, just be happy you're getting some money in your pocket. And now at 40, I'm like, screw that. I want to, I want my passion. I want what I've wanted to do since I was 14 years old when I started writing. 
whenever I hear people talk about success and stuff for me, I'm already successful because I can function and I'm getting to do something that I really enjoy. And that's how I feel about it. I feel about success in a similar way to how I feel about uh, happiness in general and that it is not a, it's not a constant. It is not a, a maintainable thing. You can't be happy all the time. You can't measure uh, success by how you have lived or are living for the past however long. It's in the moment. I feel very successful in very many aspects of my life, less so in some that I haven't you know, mastered yet. I believe that uh, success is something that is very ephemeral. You can achieve a success uh, in, in any bar that you set for yourself. And then you go on to something else. It's you know, similar to what uh, CK was saying was like, there is success to uh, having a steady job. There is success to having stability. And there is also success to doing something like this, you know, being able to create something while also struggling financially, if that happens to be your, your case. So I think there's, there's success to be had in so many different aspects of your life that people tend to think of it as this big sort of monolith of, you know, success, prestige, fame, fortune, whatever it is that they ascribe to that term. I've given up on that long ago. I am reasonably healthy. <laughs> I will say um, I have so many wonderful things in my life to be thankful for. And uh, I think I am successful in, in that way. And there's other things that I have not yet done that I would like to do that I can't honestly say I've succeeded in yet. But, you know, does that make me a success? Um, I think given all of the, the small victories that I have had throughout my life and that I manage to maintain every day, uh, and sometimes it's just getting out of bed. That can be a success enough to get you through to the next day and try to succeed at something else. <laughs> the reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Oh my goodness. So I come from an educational background and I just want to jump on this one immediately. Um, so there's, I'm not sure who the quote is by, but there's ever tried, ever failed. Worry not, try again, fail again, fail better especially in like North America, I think a lot of our society focuses on failure as a bad thing. Failure is a learning opportunity. Failures, you just figured out how not to do it. And like, um, I'm married to an engineer and I, I loved science and STEM as a kid. You have to try theories before you figure out what works. You have to test them. You can look at failure as your ultimate enemy, or you can look at it as, okay, this didn't work for me. I don't want to do that again. So I'm going to go find a different opportunity where I don't have to do that again, or this story didn't work for me or those kinds of things. Like, I think failure is such a way to learn more about yourself and what you do want to do and what you don't want to do. And I think we can learn just as much or more from our failures than we can from our successes. Yeah. I'm going to go uh, full on gay here. Just watch the most recent episode of Drag Race All-Stars. And it's interesting that you talk about failure because they were all required to give kind of like a graduation speech as if they were talking to the graduating class and one of them idiotically was all about failure and how failure is good go out in the world and fail because that's the only way you grow that's the only way you learn like Aubrey said it's the only way that you fix the mistakes and move forward so for me when I fail I go get, get in my feelings and get in my bed for a day or two and cry my eyes out and then get right back into it and so I think failure is, I don't want to say way more important than success, but failure drives the success that you end up getting. And uh, I think it's super important. Um, and by the way, just to, and just to piggyback off of what you said earlier, Kurt, this is tremendously amount of fun, by the way. I'm just <laughs> loving this. Well, thank you. <laughs> I have not seen that episode of All Stars yet, but I am a big Evie Oddly fan. So I. Uh, Spoiler alert then? Yeah. Well, I know, right? Oh, thanks, EK. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I have to look at it sort of as the flip side of what I've said already is that failure is an ephemeral thing, and I try to embrace it as much as I embrace my successes. There is a. Um, a, I believe it's a, a Buddhist philosophy, um, which has existence is suffering, which a lot of people look at and they're like, oh no, well, that's really bleak. That's, that sounds dark and depressing. It's, it's not though. Like it's, it's just, it's a statement of fact. 
from the moment we are we are born we have a limited amount of time and it's going to be hard that's just the way that existence works there's there's no morality to that statement there's no judgment to that statement it's just it's simply a fact that existence is suffering and there is failure everywhere and so i do my best to embrace that idea and to embrace my failures and sometimes it is a learning experience and sometimes it is something that makes me stronger sometimes it is something that in certain ways has such a you know a lasting effect that it does make me weaker being able to understand and accept those weaknesses and then adapt from them finding a different form of strength from it of you know all of all of survival is an adaptation to the suffering that you could potentially uh, experience I think that it applies as much to the creative space as it does to just life in general. Don't be ashamed of failure, don't be afraid of failure. You know, you have to be open to whatever the response might be. If you're going to put something out into the world as a creative person, you kind of have to stand on the mountaintop and shout it out and hope that lightning doesn't hit you. But it might, you never know. It's the chance that you take by being alive. That's all there is to it. It's just failure is another reminder that you are here, you are alive, you are breathing, and you have a a chance to succeed at something else. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as an editor, a comic writer, artist, or whatever they would like to do creatively. This anthology may set them on their own path. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Wow, that's a that's a tough one. I think the people who have been the most inspiring to me are people who were willing to share their time to teach me. Whether I I bought a class from them or you know they they it was a free opportunity. The people who have taken the time in this industry, like you always get the advice, just just make comics, just make comics, and that's true. But it, it's not a plan to get there. <laughs> and so the people that have been like just make comics, but here's how you do it have been the ones who have helped me. And I hope that I do that. And the people we work with continue to help others go down the path and, and don't gatekeep the knowledge that we have um, and continue to share it. Cause I think rising tides lifts all boat lifts all boats. For me, uh, when it comes to inspiring the next generation, I would say I was inspired by people who spoke their truth I think a lot of artists don't give themselves, uh, creators in general, don't give themselves credit enough that when you put a story out there and you're speaking to your own truth and your own experiences, it will connect with other people. And when it connects with other people, that's when you can inspire them. And I hope that, that that's what I'm doing with my story or the hard work that we're putting into the collection and my future stories. I just want to be honest and speak my truth about my disability, about my queerness. Hopefully that catches on with people and it inspires them. And then they speak their truths and that inspires other people. So I would just say, be true to yourself and create the art that you want to create and put that out into the world. Don't try to like mainstream it, talk to your honesty and it will connect and inspire people. I agree 100% with what CK just said, and I think it goes back to uh, my previous answer of what is most important, an artist or a writer or a creator of any type, is uh, openness and honesty. You know, I've worked with a lot of different mediums before. I've uh, written prose and short stories and songs and poems and music and feature-length scripts. So, you know, I've, I've worked in a lot of different aspects of creativity. And I've read comics my entire life, but I've only started uh, writing them in probably the past six or seven years. And that's because I started to read different types of works, things that were not just part of the mainstream, part of, you know, person A shows up and punches person B and so on. And I love all those things. You know, I'm a big fan of the different types of comics, but I started to read things that were more personal and more introspective and more of a reflection of the creators involved and how they felt about a certain issue and what they believed and what they were thinking. And I looked at these things and thought, this is how I write things, but in comic books, And I, it was sort of a revelation to me that you could do that. So I would always, always, always say, 
write, you know, or draw or create whatever it is you're making from a place where it resonates with you personally. Someone is going to see that. Uh, and it might just be one person and you might never meet them or anything like that, but someone is going to see that and it's going to speak to them the same way that something has spoken to you. Even if you never meet this person, it will let them know that they can do this too. They can also create, they can, you know, if they allow themselves to just be open and honest with, with who they are and what it is they're trying to express and the story that they want to tell in whatever form that takes, that's going to mean something. And I think that's the most important thing. If your life was a comic book, what would its title be? And what would sound, what soundtrack would you have with your comic? <laughs> wow. Is, yeah. <laughs> How much time you got? <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll, I'll lead there so they can have a second. And so I have a graphic novella in process actually that explores the difficulties I faced when I first became disabled and, and how that impacted my life of having to move back home and thinking my life was over. Mine is definitely going to be full circle from nowhere that I've had that in my brain since I was about 20 years old, that title soundtrack wise is very interesting. I'm not really a music person and that shocks a lot of people. I just, I don't dig music that much. The first thing that comes to mind because my graphic novella blends reality with kind of losing your grasp of reality is a uh, passion pit really speaks mm -hmm. to me. So I would probably put that on in the background as I tried to write the more fantastical elements of that story. Robert, you want to jump on that one? No, you go, Beth. <laughs> <laughs> all, right. Uh, all right. Well, I would say uh, the title would be Waifs and Strays, uh, which is the working title that I have given every project until it's come up with a more proper title. Waves and Strays is my, my go-to because it's both a lot of how I have lived my life as a waif and a stray. And also it sort of reflects the various different disparate ideas floating around in my head that I have to corral into something. The soundtrack honestly would probably have to to be some of my own music, which I've written because it's all, to a certain extent, autobiographical. It's nothing I've ever heard of. It would be the most honest answer to that question because it is everything I've written in some way is, uh, is an aspect of myself and a reflection of my life thus far. So... I mean, that's, that's what it would have to be. So I'm, I'm named after a song. My dad was a huge music fan. There's a song by Bread called Aubrey. And so, and Aubrey was her name might be a good title. And then the soundtrack would probably be a lot of like the killers. I'm from Utah originally. And that's a band that like very much hits home for me. Cause like they sing about things that are close to home. I, I could just see like weaving tons of those songs. Cause I've listened to them for like the last nearly 20 years. And then maybe a little bit of Fiona Apple, uh, lots of indie stuff, like indie rock, and a little bit of like 80s pop probably too. I'm not sure it would be the most exciting comic. We'd figure out some stories to tell. <laughs> well, I do hate to say this to all three of you, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. Before I let you all go, where can we find you? How can we support you? And of course, where is the Kickstarter currently on? So you can follow me at Chris Does Comics on Twitter, spelled just like it sounds. Uh, you can follow me on Instagram at Chris Does Comics, but with an X at the end instead of a CS. Um, I don't post as much on there. I try to stay on Twitter and promote as many indie projects as I can. You can follow the uh, anthology at Cloakroom Comics. You can also visit our website, talesfromthecloakroom.com which will just connect you right to the Kickstarter or of course, just search for tales from Scott Snyder presents tales from the cloakroom in, uh, in Kickstarter. And we would uh, love to have your support. We got lots of different reward tiers. We have a, a special announcement coming from Scott Snyder uh, that he's going to do for us. That'll help us out some give us your money. So, yeah. And if you can't give us your money, uh, retweet us and share us and show us to your friends. I'm ta at taming the muse on Twitter. And that's generally where you can find me. You can find me on Instagram with the same handle, but I, I really don't use Instagram. Any support, whether it is financial or, you know, just sharing the information is fantastic and we appreciate it. You can find me uh, on Twitter if you really, really want to. It, it's uh, just my name right here. Uh, 
Ben McRae, uh, all one word. So I'm easy enough to find there. You cannot find me in real life. I am too evasive. Uh, I have learned from previous mistakes. I have move all around. I'm like the shell game, baby. You'll never catch me. I was going to say, um, you know, you you roll 20 on agility. Is that, is that what happens? Oh, every time. I'm in that 20. My deck's through the roof. Like, <laughs> well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others, quite literally, on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. And, of course, on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia. And I'm currently updating the website as well, too. So give me a break. I'm only one person. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening, watching on Two Geeks Talking.